All right, so today we're diving deep into a really, well, kind of a dark chapter, you know, of World War II, uh, the aftermath in Indonesia. You know, we always talk about the big picture of war, but this time I think um, we're going to focus on uh, a single family story, oh. Brower von Gonsenbox, to uh, really understand the human cost of these huge events. Yeah, it's uh, it's important to remember that uh, behind these historical events, there's, uh, you know, there's always personal stories. Mm. And we're using this document called Opa. Otto de Orlog on the Bursiap PDF dot PDF. It tells the story of Otto Brower von Gonsenbach, a Dutch man uh, who was living in Indonesia during World War II. And it's just crazy, right? Like one minute everything's normal, and then boom, you know, right? Your whole world's just uh, turned upside down. Otto and his wife Christina. They had thirteen children, thirteen, and uh, they lived this uh, seemingly normal life in Padang, Sumatra. Otto worked at the Ombul and coal mines, and then Japan enters the war, and suddenly everything changes. Yeah, it's a uh... It's a moment that forced so many families into uh, just impossible situations. And for the Brower von Gonsenbox, it meant all of Otto's sons, uh, all of them were conscripted into the military. It's, yeah. uh, I mean, you think about their fates, right? It's yeah. each son's story is just a tragedy. Richard, uh, the eldest, he was captured, tortured by the Japanese at the Morea Wies in Padang mm -hmm. and, uh, and eventually executed. You know, I was reading that and thinking about the family back home mm -hmm. and how they must felt, you know. Knowing that their son was suffering like that. Oh yeah, absolutely. It's um, it really speaks to the uh, the Japanese occupation was incredibly brutal and right. torture was just you know commonplace. Horrific. Yeah. Uh, and then there's Rain. He uh, died working on the Packenborough railway line. These railways were essentially death traps, right? Yeah. Just horrific conditions. Yeah, and uh, you know the Packenborough line that was part of this much larger uh, Japanese strategy. They needed wow. to connect Thailand and Burma. Yeah. To support their war effort, and they used uh, you know. Prisoners of war and forced laborers to do it. Thousands died from disease, starvation, overwork. God. And then there's Wim. Wim perished when uh, the prisoner transport ship he was on. The Harugi Kumaru. This was, was torpedoed. Can you imagine being trapped on a sinking ship? And the, uh, the Harugi Kumaru was originally a Dutch ship. The Van Werrick, captured and repurposed by the Japanese. It's really just a symbol of yeah. you know how war turns everything into instruments of suffering. Yeah. Uh, then we have Ludwig. He was shot trying to escape captivity. I mean, it just shows how desperate hmm. these men were for freedom. And the uh, the pressure they were under, even if escape seemed impossible, that little sliver of hope, it was enough to make them risk everything. Right. And Freddie, Freddie's story is uh, <laughs> what breaks my heart. He was the youngest son, and he loved to draw. This innocent passion led to his death. Right. The Japanese suspected him of espionage and beheaded him. This is just a... Uh, you, you know, a chilling example of the paranoia and suspicion during the occupation, how easily the most harmless activities could be twisted and used to justify violence. Yeah. It's awful. Now, uh, Otto's wife, Christina, she died in the Bankanang women's camp in August of 1945, surrounded by her daughters. Imagine losing your sons one by one and then your wife while you're trapped in a camp yourself. And uh, And Otto was actually tasked with keeping death lists at the camp. So he would have known about his sons and wife's deaths soon mm. after they happened. Yeah, that's unbearable. And for the Brower von Gonsenbox, you know, the war's end, it didn't bring peace. Instead, they faced a new wave of terror, the Bershiot period. Yeah, this is a period that's uh, often, you know, mm -hmm. overshadowed by the war itself. But it was incredibly violent, chaotic. As Indonesia fought for independence from the Dutch, this power vacuum emerged. And uh, with it, a surge of violence against anyone seen as a symbol of colonial rule. And it wasn't just, you know, Dutch soldiers. It was civilians, too. Dutch, Indo, Chinese, Moluccan people. One of the groups involved in this violence was the Pemoeda. Uh, the Pemoeda were a uh, youth militia group driven by uh, anti-colonial sentiment mm. and a desire for uh, retribution. Their actions were incredibly brutal, and they played a significant role in uh, <laughs> in the violence that erupted during this period. And the violence was just... yeah. I mean, bamboo spears, Japanese bayonets, torture, mass killings. It's hard to even wrap your head around it. Yeah, it's a uh, it's a stark reminder that uh, that revolutions, even those fought for freedom, yeah. can often devolve into these cycles of violence and revenge. And for the Brower von Gunzenbach, this violence would hit even closer to home. Closer to home is right. It's um, it's hard to believe what happened next, but uh, well, we'll get to that in just a minute. Otto's extended family, you know, they were, I guess, looking for safety in numbers. Mm -hmm. So they all moved into this house on Jalan Belakong Olo in Padang. And uh, just tragic. 
you know, because it turned out to be the worst possible decision. Yeah, it's like they thought they were finding refuge, but they yeah. ended up right in the heart of the storm. Right in the heart of it. On November 18th, 1945, extremists, uh, they attacked the house and just massacred everyone inside. Somewhere between 26 and 34 of Otto's relatives, men, women, children, no one was spared. It's just unimaginable. The, uh, the brutality. There were eyewitness accounts describing a, a baby being thrown into the air yeah. and impaled on a bayonet. Oh, my God. It's just chilling. And it's, if that wasn't bad enough, some family members were abducted and their bodies were later found on Pulapisang Island, mutilated. Yeah, it's just, uh, I mean, it's just pure terror, right? The mutilation and the way the bodies were displayed, it's all designed to, uh, to instill fear and crush any resistance. It's sickening. And you know what makes it even worse? The British, who were supposed to be maintaining order, they were stationed just a few hundred meters away from the house. Yeah. And they didn't intervene. Yeah, that's the uh, that's the question that's uh, yeah. haunted historians for years. Why didn't they act? Was it a deliberate decision or was it uh, just a failure? Well, we know the British faced immense challenges, disarming the Japanese, repatriating prisoners, trying to contain uh, the independence movement. But still, their inaction, it's difficult to reconcile. You know, did they underestimate the threat? Or were they just uh, caught in a political bind? It's, uh, it's hard to say for sure. Some argue that... Uh, the British just didn't understand the threat from mm -hmm. groups like the Pemoeda. Others believe ah, that they were just trying to avoid antagonizing the independence movement while also, you know, trying to protect civilians. Whatever the reason, the consequences were devastating. It's uh, it's just a tragic reminder that uh, even with the best intentions, these peacekeeping efforts can fail. And for the victims, there's the added pain of knowing that justice was never really served. Right. The document mentions that some suspects were arrested, but many probably escaped punishment. And for survivors like Peter Havinga and Johnny Sapulet, they managed to escape the massacre. But I can't imagine how difficult it must have been for them, knowing that the people responsible might never face justice. The trauma. The uh, yeah. It must have been unbearable. And then there's Amelia. She was 15 years old, abducted, assaulted. They found her later in a state of shock. Her story is, uh, it really highlights the vulnerabilities of women and girls during these times. Awful. This document, uh, it, it doesn't really delve into you know, the psychological effects of these experiences, mm -hmm. but it's not hard to imagine the impact, the long-term trauma. Oh, absolutely. The PTSD, the anxiety, the survivor's guilt. These wounds can last a lifetime. And, you know, it's not just the individuals. It's the families, the communities. Yeah. The impact ripples outward. Yeah, it really makes you think about the true cost of conflict beyond just the immediate casualties. Right. It's the it's the lasting legacy of pain and suffering. And it's a legacy that's uh, often overlooked in history books. That's why documents like this are so important. They give us a, uh, a glimpse into the human side of these events. Absolutely. Uh, actually, the document mentions this book, Kuda, by Lou Lansing. Oh, yeah. That's a... Uh, that's considered a seminal work on the birth shop period. It sounds like it could offer a uh, yeah. a broader context to what we're learning about the Brower von Gansenbach. Absolutely. It goes into more detail about the motivations of different groups, the scale of the violence, the mm -hmm. political landscape at the time. It's a powerful book and uh, at times a difficult read, but it really gives you a much richer understanding of the birth shop period. So, uh, you know, after going through all of this, what can we really take away from this, this deep dive into the Burr von Gonsenbach family's experience? Well, for me, it's a reminder that uh, that individual stories are so important for understanding the human cost of war. Right. Otto's story is tragic, but it's just one thread in this vast tapestry of suffering. But by focusing on his family, we get a much more, I don't know, visceral understanding of what it meant to live through those times. Absolutely. It also shows that uh, the yep. vi violence of war, it extends far beyond the battlefield. And its impact can last for generations. For generations. And I think it also highlights the importance of research and dialogue about these often overlooked periods of history. The Bursica period is still relatively unknown. And it's so important that we, uh, mm -hmm. that we continue to learn about it, mm. to share these stories so they're not forgotten. You know, as we've been talking about all this, I keep thinking about this one detail. In the document, Otto's nickname, Inug Otto, One-Eyed Otto. Oh, right, from that childhood accident with the pocket knife. Yeah. Yeah, it just it just makes it real, you know? It's like behind all the tragedy, there's this guy, this dad who had a whole life before the war, just ripped it all away. Right, it makes you think about 
uh, all those other parts of his life that the document doesn't even mention. Like, what was he like before all this? What were his hobbies? You know, exactly. And all the other people who lived through this, the Bercy period, what were their stories? This document is just one tiny piece of a much bigger picture. That's what I love about these personal stories. They pull you in, make you feel connected to the past on a human level. And it reminds you that history is more than just dates and battles. It's about people. And sometimes it's the little things, those small details that hit you the hardest. Like here's this guy who lost his eye as a kid and then goes through all this horror and somehow he keeps going. It's incredible. The resilience of the human spirit, the ability to find strength in the darkest times. It's inspiring. So as we wrap up, I keep thinking about how learning about Otto and this whole Berziap period changes how we see World War II and what came after. Yeah, it definitely makes you question that idea of a clean break between war and peace. The fighting might stop, but the violence doesn't just disappear, it changes form. And it shows how important it is to uncover these hidden stories, the voices that don't always make it into the history books. Exactly. We need to think critically about conflict, about the long-term effects, and how it impacts people and communities, sometimes for generations. Mm -hmm. If anyone out there is as fascinated by this as we are, we highly recommend Lou Lansing's book, Kura. It goes deeper into the Berziat period giving more detail about the events we talked about today. It's an important read. It'll stick with you. You know, we talk a lot about learning from the past. And I think Otto's story and all the others from this period, they teach us a lot about the human cost of war, about empathy, and how important it is to work towards a more peaceful world. Well said. These stories are powerful reminders that history isn't just something that happened long ago. It shapes who we are today and can guide us as we move forward. Thanks for joining us on this journey. It's been heavy. But I think it's so important to bring these stories to light, to honor the people who suffered, and to help us all understand the past and its impact, even today.